Good morning. Welcome to Osco Community Church. My name is Pastor Paul Henschel. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us, whether up here, downstairs, online. Hello, hello. I just have a few announcements uh, to highlight as we get going this morning. Uh, we are excited, especially after yesterday's weather, about summer coming. Yay. All right. And with summer, we have some great opportunities for uh, VBS, and uh, we're excited about that coming up in July. If you are able to help with that, that would be fantastic. You can uh, sign up in the back in the foyer uh, or talk to Kelly Akers with any questions you might have. We also have summer camp opportunities. If Kids, if you're interested in going to summer camp, uh, want more information on that, you can talk to Pastor John. There's also a scholarship uh, to help fund that for you, make that more possible. Uh, because uh, also uh, we have um, Andover Days is coming up. We've announced before that we were possibly trying to do a float for that parade. Uh, we have had no interest so far. So we would love to have this happen, but I am not going to ask Pastor John to do it by himself. So uh, if you would like to see that happen, if you would like to uh, be a part of that, it's going to be on June 5th. We need help with that. Uh, this is kind of the last call, so if you want to help with that, please talk to him uh, today, if at all possible. Uh, and also, uh, we're not going to be having the senior high Sunday school, senior high class. If you can meet with Pastor John, is going to be teaching in the fellowship hall. So if you can just absorb into that class, that would be wonderful. So uh, let me uh, pray as we get going. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the blessing of being able to gather uh, with your people to praise your name, to hear from your word, uh, to draw close together to you and to one another as the family of God. And Lord, we thank you so much that we can do that. And we pray that you would bless our time this morning. Pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would lift our burdens, that you would challenge us um, to draw us closer to who you are. And we pray that you would do all this for your glory. Amen. Good morning, Osco. There's more than three of you out there. Good morning, Osco. That's much better. Let's stand as we worship this morning. Worship the Lord with our hearts and our voices. Like the sun. 
King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You God, we just praise you this morning and we just thank you for all that you have done for us. Father, for the way that you have changed our hearts, that you have rescued us, you, you have ransomed us, you have been what we needed in the times when we sometimes didn't even know you were there. But God, thank you that because of your goodness and your mercy, because of the trust that we have in you, that we can build our lives day by day. That everything that we go through today can be a stepping stone for tomorrow. That we can walk in faith, trusting you for all that you've done for us. Continues to remind us of who you are and how much you love us. And we just thank you so much that in this time this morning, we can lift your name high. And to say, Jesus, we love you. And thank you because you are worthy. In Jesus' name. sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Yeah. 
song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him.
Good morning again. Uh, we are almost done with First Peter. We have this week and next week. Uh, I hope and pray it's been a blessing for you as we've dug into this book that has a powerful message for those going through challenging times, and we certainly have been uh, in different ways in the last year. Just wanted to give you a preview of what's ahead in case you're wondering. In June, Lord willing, we're going to be starting a series on the book of Judges. And I know most of you are like, oh, okay, Judges, okay. I, I, I know that, you know, to many, Judges is just one of those dusty books in the Old Testament that we don't pay much attention to or think about. But the book of Judges is an awesome book. It's one of my favorites. It's filled with great storytelling, a powerful message that is very relevant for us today. Uh, it's a book uh, about what happens when people reject God as their king, uh, when everyone is true to themselves and does what's right in their own eyes, and it shows the devastating consequences of that, those things. Um, Judges gives us both uh, sober warnings, wake-up calls, but it also has some great encouragement that even through those darkest of days when evil just seems to be everywhere, when things seem to be going from bad to worse, that God is still there, that he is still working out his plan, his purposes. And I'm excited to dive into that with you starting uh, second week of June. And I, I bring this up now to encourage you as well to, hey, in your own time, uh, take some time to read through that book between now and then, even take a couple versions and read through it into a couple different versions, jot down some questions that I'm sure you'll have along the way, and uh, look forward to that time uh, starting in June. Uh, let's pray as we dive into First Peter once again. Father God, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, to worship you, uh, and to hear from you. And we pray that you would help us this morning, that you would uh, quiet our other stuff that is running uh, in the background of our hearts and minds. And I pray that you would help us to focus uh, on what you are saying and, and how it applies to our lives. Uh, Lord, I confess that I am woefully inadequate to um, communicate, to represent what this message is about humility. I have so much to learn there myself. Uh, but Lord, I pray that your word would speak through, that your word would be planted in our hearts, and that you would help us all in different ways to grow in this grace of humility. Um, yes, in our relationships here at church, but at home, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, uh, wherever we go, that we would have this quality about us of humility, both before e each other and other people, and before you as well. And we thank you and, and pray that you would help us to grow in these ways. I uh, pray that you would use this morning to that end for your glory. Amen. Uh, Chuck Swindoll has a great quote on the subject of attitude that I wanted to start with this morning. Words can never adequ adequately convey the incredible impact of our attitude toward life. The longer I live, the more I become uh, convinced that life is 10% what happens to us, and 90% how we respond to it. I believe the single most significant decision I can make on a day-to-day -day basis is my choice of attitude. It is more important than my past, my education, my bankroll, my successes or failure, fame or pain, what other people think of me or say about me, my circumstances or my position. Attitude keeps me going or cripples my progress. It alone fuels my fire or assaults my hope. When my attitude is right, there is no barrier too high, no valley too deep, no dream too extreme, no challenge too great for me. Our attitude, our mindset has a huge impact on how we live, how we respond to life. It affects how we start off each day, how we evaluate our day at the end of the day and how we respond to everything in between, success or failure, difficulty, challenges. Uh, it impacts how we respond to other people, how we view them and treat them, how we talk to them and about them. All that's directed, controlled by attitude. 
And this attitude doesn't just affect us as individuals, as little pods. It affects others around us. Attitude is contagious, infectious. It rubs off. If you are around a positive person or a grumpy person for long enough, pretty soon you're going to start to be that as well. Winston Churchill so well said, attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Attitude is a small thing that has a huge impact on our lives. And I think that's why in our passage for this morning, as Peter writes to a church that was in a pressure cooker situation of life, he encourages them, he urges them, he commands them to adopt the key attitude of humility toward others and toward God. And as we here come to this text this morning, many of us, too, are in pressure cookers of our own for different reasons. Maybe you are suffering for your faith, as Peter's original readers were. Or maybe you are burdened by things going on around you in your life or inside of you, or just there's just a lot going on around you or inside of you. Or you're afraid of what is around the corner, what might be ahead. Maybe you are just worn down and and weary from all the stress and isolation of the last year. Maybe your health is struggling, your patience is gone, your family is broken, your marriage is struggling, your finances are tapped out, your dreams are shattered. Maybe you are in the midst of one of those times when it just seems like the walls are closing in on you and you're overwhelmed, you're maxed out, you're alone, you're stressed, you're at the end of yourself. Now, all of us aren't there at this moment, but in a group this size, some of us are. And those of us that aren't, well, we've been there before, and sooner or later we'll be back there again. And it's in those challenging times, those pressure cooker moments, when our attitude is so important and also so vulnerable. Because it's in that pressure cooker that we can so easily be tempted to let our attitude turn sour and turn selfish. To let that pressure cooker bring out the worst in us as we take out our stress and frustrations on others. Or we kick back and defend our rights. We hurt those who hurt us. Or we compromise our faith. We take matters into our own hands doing whatever we think or feel is best regardless of what God says. Or we try to relieve the pressure by pridefully turning to sin or idols or self as the solution instead of to God. And so Peter urges us, whether we're in that pressure cooker of life right now or not, to humbly rest in our great God's sovereign care. Why? Well, because it's there and only there that we find freedom. We find relief from the pressure cooker. Freedom from having to sustain ourselves. Freedom from having to prove ourselves. From having to figure it all out and manage things and control people and do all this. And worry and and anxiety in our life. We get get freedom there. Not, Not freedom from the pressure cooker necessarily, but freedom in the midst of it. As we're going to see this morning in our passage, freedom is found when we humbly rest in God's sovereign care. Our passage is in 1 Peter 5, verse 5 through 7. I invite you to turn there with me if you haven't done so already. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. There we're going to see how we should humble ourselves both before each other and God and also the benefits that we get if we do that. In the passage right before this, last week, uh, our first four verses of this chapter, Peter urged the elders, the leaders of the church, to be shepherds of God's flock that is under their care, serving as overseers. We saw, and I hope we're challenged by the reality, that times like these call for leaders who can shepherd God's people with humility and faithfulness. Elders who are willing to serve willingly, eagerly, as good examples to the flock. And now, flowing from that, at the start of our passage this morning, Peter turns to address the rest of the church and the church as a whole, okay? If that's how elders are supposed to be and conduct themselves, how should the rest of us respond to that leadership? Peter urges us to be humble before each other. Verse 5, young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Why does Peter single out the young men here? Well, on the one hand, the young men might 
especially need to hear these words. But I think on the other hand, these words are intended for all those who aren't elders. The young men are just serving as representatives of the rest of the congregation. Young men can sometimes be a bit more impulsive and headstrong, perhaps more prone to resent and buck authority, perhaps more impatient, lacking wisdom that comes with maturity. And because of all this, they might be more prone to chafe under the elder's authority. And so Peter singles them out, tells them to humbly submit. But what he says to the young men applies to the rest of the congregation as well. They're just easy representatives to single out. So what is this command that, yes, applies to especially to the young men, especially to those who are younger, less mature in their faith, but also to everyone who is an elder. They are to submit to the leadership of the elders. And I know that's a word that we just love in our culture. Submit. Wonderful. Tell me more, Pastor. Well, submission doesn't mean just a mute acceptance of decisions. It doesn't mean a blind following of whatever the leaders say. There's a place for expressing disagreement, voicing concerns, and, and by the way, that place is to the actual leaders, not just to your spouse or friends or on social media. But submission is primarily an attitude of respect, of, of honoring those God has called to this role of leadership. And, and that, in a healthy congregation, is what the response of the congregation should be to the leaders. And if the leaders are off base, if they're violating scripture, if they're overstepping their authority, then obviously that needs to be addressed and the congregation needs to obey the higher authority of God and his word. But the normal operating procedure, the default attitude position should be of the flock submitting to cooperating with the leadership as we seek together to follow God's will for the church. We read this also in Hebrews 13 verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. We, we chafe against this kind of language in democratic, individualistic America, where we are taught every day, bombarded with the message every day, that there are only three legitimate authorities in your life, right? Me, myself, and I are the only legitimate authorities over my life. We're taught that every day. Or we think it only applies to leaders if they're doing things that we agree with. And if they aren't, well, then I don't have to listen to them. I don't have to respect them. And yet scripture is clear about this. We need to get back to taking our cues from our attitude uh, concerning those in leadership from the Bible, not, not our culture. I like how commentator I. Howard Marshall put it, leadership does not mean superiority and the right to domineer. Followership does not confer the right to undermine. I think that's something we struggle with as Americans sometimes. We always have a right to undermine. Elders are to faithfully, lovingly shepherd the sheep God has entrusted to them. They're to watch over their lives and doctrine, to lead them well, not by force, but in care and service as examples. They're to feed them from God's word, nourishing them with pure spiritual food. They're not to lead by lording, but by serving. And the congregation is to follow that lead and example, to be submissive to that. How does that happen? How does that look practically? Well, starts by listening to them carefully, uh, not just hearing what you want to hear, but what they're saying. And if you have questions, concerns, go and talk to them. Try and understand better. It happens by following their lead, obeying, instead of second-guessing every decision that maybe you weren't a part of. It happens by working with them as a part of the same team rather than just working around them. It happens by honoring them, praying for them, supporting them as men who have been entrusted by God to care for you instead of undermining them. It means giving them the benefit of the doubt sometimes. Sometimes decisions are made for reasons that they might know, but you might not. It means, as we see in Hebrews, not making their job any more difficult than it has to be through your bad attitude or divisiveness or apathy or disregard. 
and supporting them with your prayers, your words, your actions, your attitudes. God has placed them in that position for a reason. You honor them, and in doing so, you honor God. But what makes all this really work for leaders and for the congregation is something that not just one group or the other is supposed to do. It, no, it's all of us are supposed to do it, whether we're in leadership or not. We read it again in verse 5. All of you, all of you, everybody, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. All of us, elders, leaders, members, congregation, are to put on, are to clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. And we all need to practice humility because we all need to work on it more. That's why we need to practice it. It takes practice. It doesn't come naturally. We all tend to think we know better than everybody else, even that we are better than everybody else. We're more important than everybody else. We might not say it like that, but how we act sometimes points to that. C.S. Lewis has some helpful words here. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, and no woman, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in somebody else, that being pride. Isn't that right? When you see it in somebody else, you're like, oh, they're so prideful. And meanwhile, you're like, you know, just as prideful. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can tell you the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. If you think you are not conceited, it means that you are very conceited indeed. Likewise, John Stott wrote, at every step of our Christian development, and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is the greatest enemy, and humility our greatest friend. Every step, every part, every sphere of the Christian life is affected by this, for good or for bad, for pride or for humility. Humility comes from a proper understanding of who we are and who God is, it recognizes that all we have, all that we are, comes from God. Everything is a gift. Nothing is earned. And so humility isn't about tearing yourself down or hiding in the corner or feeling embarrassed about the gifts that God has given you. But it's about a recognition that whatever we have, whatever we've achieved, is from God. And he could have just as easily given it to somebody else. And someday we'll have to give it all back and give an account for what we have done with it. And when it comes to how we relate to others, humility means not just treating other people like extras in the movie of your life. You know, where you think the movie, the, my movie, is all about me. And you guys are all just extras. And you got to play your part. And you got to do what I want. And you gotta, no, that's not what humility does. No, humility means not just looking out for my interests, but the interests of of others as well. It means serving others, not using them as means that I can get something from them that I want, not using them just so that I can get something out of them, but serving them, truly helping and blessing them. And that's the whole goal. Being extras, playing a supporting role in the movie of their life. I want you to think about that this week. What would it mean if I were to be an extra, if I were to play a supporting role and everybody else around me. Not make it about me. Think about that. The well-known prayer of Francis of Assisi, I think, captures this heart of humility toward others so well. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy, O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. That, that's a prayer of humility, of not God, please bless me, but God, please make me a blessing for others. Use me as an instrument of your grace and peace in the life of others. So often our lives, our focus, our desires, even our prayers are focused on me. God, give me this. Help me be consoled. Help me be loved and understood and blessed. But this prayer focuses on being that person for others. It's a prayer that gets the spotlight off of me 
and looks outward to others in service and humility. And in many ways, as we see here, humility isn't about thinking too much or too little about yourselves. It's about forgetting ourselves as we give and serve and love for the benefit of others and the glory of God. The spotlight isn't anywhere near us. And I love that Peter tells us to clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. It's something we have to consciously, purposely put on every morning. Uh, The word refers to an apron which a servant would put on before doing tasks. And it's very likely here, I think, that Peter is recalling the time when Jesus clothed himself in humility, when he wrapped the towel around himself and washed the disciples' feet. The God of glory washing the dirt and grime and gunk off their smelly feet. And that same humility is what we, too, are to wrap ourselves in. We are to humble ourselves for the sake of others, for their blessing and good. In our dealings with others, we are to put on that apron of humility to be ready to wash dirty, smelly feet of other people. Again, this applies to all of us, leaders, members. All of us are to respond, to relate to one another in humility, in our leading and in our following. I mean, can you imagine what our church would look like if we were to all grow in these ways? Humility is essential for building and maintaining unity. It dissolves animosity. It paves the way for forgiveness and reconciliation. And when, we, when those things aren't happening, when unity isn't happening, when forgiveness and reconciliation isn't happening, when there's animosity, how much of it comes back to pride? We need to walk in the footsteps of Christ. Who didn't? think that he was more important than everybody else, even though he was. He was God. But instead, he lowered himself to the status of a slave in service and love toward others. As he said, Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And as he said, after he washed his disciples' feet in John 13, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. This humility toward one another involves serving one another, but it goes beyond just using our gifts to help one another. That's a given, but it goes all the way down to that role of a servant, a slave. After all, Jesus possessed many gifts, uh, teaching, prophecy, doing miracles, but he was not above the work of a servant, doing whatever was needed to be done, no matter how lowly it might have been. And that should be our work, too, our attitude at at home, at work, here at church, in our neighborhoods. We shouldn't look at certain things that need to be done and say, well, that's somebody else's job. Certainly, washing the disciples' feet should have been somebody else's job, not the Son of God's. And yet, Jesus did it. And he says... I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. We need to be willing to do the dirty work, the unglamorous things, clean the toilets, or plunge the toilets, clean up after a meal, or whatever else. To do the things that uh, no one's going to know about, or see, or appreciate, but God. It isn't fun, it isn't glamorous, there's no praise, but that serving, that humility prompts us to jump in and fill the gaps. And I'm I'm so thankful for many of you who do have that attitude. Your response is not, well, that's not my gift, or I don't have time for that, or I've already put in my due, my share of work. Uh, Those are not the attitudes of someone who has a humble servant heart. And I appreciate very much those that, that do. And I could name names, but then you'd be embarrassed, and you'd lose your reward in heaven. Or, and you maybe even get prideful, so we won't do that. But every church needs those kind of servants. We need more of those. That's what being a Christian, what being a member of a church is about. It's not about what you get. It's not like you're some member of some Christian country club. It's not about what you get. It's what you give. It's a commitment to humbly serve others and God in that place. Hum- humility is essential in the life of a Christian. In many ways, it's a defining mark of a true Christian. And so look for those opportunities. They're everywhere. If you can't find any, ask me. I'll help you find some. 
If you're one-time things or serve on a ministry team going, on, going forward. And moving forward in our passage, I love, too, that Peter tells us to first be humble toward others before he gets to being humble toward God. Because I think if he had started with our humility before God first, it's easier for us to fool ourselves. It's easier for us to fool ourselves into thinking when we're alone in our quiet times with God that we are the most humble, loving, gracious people around, as long as I don't have to be around anybody else. I know that's true for me. But where our love, where our humility before God is proven and where it is grown so often is in our relationships with others. And so if, if love, if humility is not flowing out of our relationship with God into our relationship with others, the Bible is clear. There is no real love or humility before God to begin with. And so maybe we need to go back to the source further upstream to fix the problem there. Because it's not fix the problem in your lack of humility before others by focusing on that. No, you need to go further upstream. You need to work on your humility before God, and that will overflow into your relationships with others. And we see this close connection even in verse 5. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Why? What is our motivation? Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we see here first that we humble ourselves before God by recognizing who he is. That he and he alone is God. And we most certainly are not. That he is eternally and perfectly powerful and wise and loving and sovereign. And we, well, we in all our glory and strength, well, we're Peter Henschel. We're a joke. We're a drop in the bucket. And we see this theme of God opposing the proud throughout Scripture that God sets himself against those who would exalt themselves or love themselves or are driven by their own selfish ambition, who blindly raise themselves up to be the be-all, end-all. Peter reminds us of this as he quotes from Proverbs 3.34, that God sets himself in battle against those who lift themselves up. This is serious. And better by far is to humble yourself, to bring yourself low so God doesn't have to. Better because instead of being met with God opposed to you, you will find God abundantly for you. Uh, Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 69, 33, the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Isaiah 66, 2, this is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, and so on. He gives grace to the humble. Humility is a confession of our emptiness that God loves to graciously fill. He showers down unearned favor and blessing on those who humble themselves. Nothing could be worse than to have God on the opposite team set against you. And nothing is more essential to receiving his grace than humility. You will never receive the gospel. You will never make it to heaven without humility. You won't think you need the gospel. You will think you can do it on your own. You can save yourself. You've been a good person. Why should I have to ask God for help? No, entrance into the kingdom requires that we die to ourselves, that we humble ourselves to admit that we have messed up and need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. We are helplessly and hopelessly lost. And so having started out the Christian life in that way, why should we think that moving forward it would be any different? The way to be the object of his grace is to humble yourself before him, before others, lower yourselves under his sovereign care. Now that lowering, that true humility isn't about just, you know, beating ourselves up, degrading ourselves, endlessly groveling, saying how unworthy we are, I'm worthless, I'm nothing. That's not true humility. That's really, in a lot of ways, just another form of pride because the focus, the attention, even the spotlight of our worship is still on us. But true humility before God recognizes our complete dependence on him. And it's expressed by accepting our role, our position, and God's plan and will, whatever it might be. Can we call him Lord and yet 
He brings things into our life and we shake our fist at him? It doesn't buck and rebel against it, but seeks to serve God in the midst of it. Whatever circumstance or situation he has placed us in, and that applies even when those situations are hard and painful, when they are the pressure cookers of life. And in those pressure cookers of life, how do we cope? How do we deal with that? Well, in America, we're told to knuckle down and pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. We're told to frantically try and control and manage everything or get a few more apps on your phone so that you can hopefully manage everything better. But it's not through pride in our own self-sufficiency. It's not through pride in looking to ourselves to solve things or manage things or do things as if the world would fall apart if we stopped for five minutes. Humility that looks to God, remembers and rests in who he is, that he is God. That's where we find freedom and hope and salvation. We need to humbly rest in the reality of who he is, our sovereign and loving God. There we find freedom from the endless rat race of pride and self. But also, secondly, we find that freedom in humbling ourselves before God by trusting in his will and timing. Even through those hard times. We see that next in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. In the Old Testament, the mighty hand of God refers to God moving in powerful ways to deliver his people from trouble and distress. Uh, Exodus 13.3. Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Or Nehemiah uh, 1, 10, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and by your mighty hand. This phrase points to God's work, especially his work in saving and redeeming his people. The hand of God speaks figuratively of his determining, his controlling the course of history, the destinies of men. Yes, in the big picture, but also in the small. And so when Peter commands us to humble ourselves under this mighty hand, it means for us to accept all that comes from that hand, even the hard and difficult times, as being a part of that bigger plan that will ultimately lead to our deliverance and salvation. And that takes trust sometimes. It takes listening to his word and his promise, even when circumstances around us or our feelings, our gut is telling us not to. But when we humble ourselves under his mighty hand, we don't rail against him saying, why did this happen to me? Or what did I do to deserve this? Nor do we rage against those who are causing the difficulty or hardship, but instead we put our trust in God, in his sovereign care, in his perfect will and timing, that in his time, in his place, he will make things right. He will raise us up. And we seek to serve and honor him even in the pressure cooker. And I hope you see more and more the freedom that we can find when we do these things, when we humble ourselves before God. Because when we recognize who God is, when we put our trust in him and in his perfect timing and will to see us through, to be right there with us, to ultimately, in the end, lift us up, no matter what junk he has to lead us through in the meantime, well, that, that's immensely freeing. Because the pressure is off of us. We don't need to prove anything. God is all the proof we need. He's God. He's got it. He's in control. We're just along for the ride. We're just enjoying the scenery. We don't need to rely on our own strength or beauty or intelligence because God is going to provide. His grace is always sufficient. Our trust is well placed in him. As Pastor Stephen Cole so well said, humility is not only being aware of our own insufficiency, but trusting in Christ's all-sufficiency. Humility is not only being aware of our own insufficiency, but trusting in Christ's all-insufficiency, all-sufficiency. And usually, we just do that first part, and that's what leads to worry. We say, oh, I'm not sufficient, so i got to worry about this. i got to think about this. i got to toss and turn about this all night long. But humility says, yes, I am insufficient, but it also looks to Christ as all sufficient. We don't need to worry about raising ourselves up. We leave that to him. We're down, yes, 
We leave that to him. We can trust that in his perfect timing, he will raise us up. And we say, well, I don't know. I'm in a tough spot. I've been humbled. I'm you know, really under it. You know, okay, none of us have gotten lower than Christ. And you know what? God raised him up. He's got the big picture covered just as he raised up Christ from the dead. So he will raise us up. We just need to be faithful with each day he gives us, seeking to humbly follow him in the footsteps of Christ. Aren't you glad our lives aren't just directed by fate or weird circumstances or chance, but by our gracious and loving, sovereign God? Freedom is found when we humbly rest in God's sovereign care. We need to show this humility before others, before God, by recognizing who he is, trusting in his will and timing. But finally, and this is where this reality of freedom really comes home for us, I think. We humble ourselves before God by handling, handing over our worries to his care. Verse 7. Cast your anxiety or your worries on him because he cares for you. That's a precious, a familiar verse to many of us. The reality that we can cast the heavy burden of our cares on God because he lovingly, sovereignly cares for us. Or as someone has paraphrased, you can throw the whole weight of your anxieties on him for you are his personal concern. We can unload all our worries on him because he cares so dearly for us. Uh, the word translated anxieties comes from the word meaning to divide. And anxiety, our worries, produce so often a divided mind and heart. We're pulled this way and that. We're constantly distracted. We're constantly disturbed or on edge or tense or stressed. Worry and anxiety distract us from the productive things God wants us to do. Instead, they consume us by diverting all our thoughts into those channels of fear. There's no rest. There's no freedom there. We're enslaved by our anxieties and worries. Even though if we were to write down all our worries and concerns, we were to honestly look at them, I would encourage you to do that someday. Just write down everything you're worried about and concerned about, stressed out about. And then look at the list and see, well, how many of these things don't really matter in the grand scheme of things? few weeks from now, I won't even think of it anymore. But how the, these things just weigh on us in the moment. And then there's other things on the list that we have no power to solve or change. Many of the things we worry about have nothing to do with us, at least not immediately. Some things will take care of themselves. Other involve God's timing. Still others are things that we should pray about and then leave it at that. And when we realize these things, it reminds us that we don't have to solve all our problems. We can rest in God's sovereign care. We can cast our cares on him, even if it's just God. Please help. Because either he carries the worry or we do. And if we do, we'll be divided, we'll be distracted, we'll be disturbed, we'll be confused, frustrated, burdened. If he carries the load, well, we may still have trouble and difficulties, but... Not that consuming anxiety, not that dominating fear, not that hopeless despair. And we know this. Why don't we do it? <laughs> Makes all the sense in the world. Cast it on God and he'll take care of it. But I think we don't do it, and I say we, and I mean me, among that. We don't do it because in our pride, we don't want to. We don't want to let it go. We think we can handle it by ourselves. Or in our self-importance, we think that we can't afford to hand it fully over to God. We think we are essential. That it's only by our obsessing over it that it's going to turn out okay. We think that we don't have the time to pray. We have to do this and that and so many other things. We don't have time to pray. And how much of our lack of prayer in our lives comes back to pride. Humility says, I cannot carry my load, my cares, my anxiety, so I need to go to God. But pride will never do that. Pride depends on self. Pride exalts in independence. A praying life reveals a humble life, but pride doesn't pray. Pride says, I can do it. I must do it. But prayer says, I can't do it. 
But God can, he must, and he will. That's why we need to humble ourselves to stop trusting in ourselves, our ability to work through all these challenges of life and turn in prayerful dependence, cast our cares on God. After all, suppose you were on a ship which encountered a fierce storm at sea. And you don't know anything about handling a ship in rough waters, but the captain of the ship is a seasoned veteran who has brought his ship safely through many countless storms just as this. Wouldn't it be the height of arrogance for you to go up and tell him how to run the ship? Or even worse, to take control of the ship from him? Mutiny? But how often do we do the same with God? If we were anxious in the storm, your fears would subside if you stopped to think about how capable and experienced the captain was. If you had a chance to talk to him, he'd assure you that he'd been through many such storms. And you could relax and trust that he would get you through this one, too. You might still be in for a rough ride, but you could go through it without anxiety because you humbled yourself by not taking control and by putting your trust in the captain. And so often... We need to do the same in our life with God. Or take the story of a boy who was walking along the road carrying a heavy load on his shoulders. And a man came along in a horse-drawn carriage and offered him a ride. And the boy climbed on, but he kept that heavy load on his shoulders. And the man asked him, well, why don't you put the heavy load down on the cart? And the boy replied, well, he didn't want to burden the horse. Friends, we have climbed into the cart of salvation through Christ. He is, in fact, already bearing the heavy load that is on your shoulders this morning. Why don't we let it go (laughs) and let him have it all? He's bearing it all anyway. He can handle it. His strength is enough. His track record is flawless, his power and competency competency and wisdom is perfect. Freedom is found when we humbly take that load off us and put it on him. When we rest in God's sovereign care, we can find shelter from the storm, we can find relief from the pressure cooker of this life when we humbly rest in his sovereign and caring arms. So give your worries and cares to him. Don't take them back. Leave them with him. As Paul also urges us in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything. Oh, how do I do that? It's impossible. Well, it is impossible if you just focus on that part, but he tells you how to do it. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He cares for us more than we can ever understand. I think we secretly fear, well, maybe he can't be trusted in everything. Maybe he can't take care of this part of my life. And so in pride, we decide, well, I better manage that part of my life. And then we wonder why we're frustrated, why we're burned out, why it all ends up blowing up in our face. So often our problem is theological. We have never settled the question, what kind of God do I believe in? We've never settled the question of whether we really believe in a God that cares for us. Or we forget. We think he does. We hope he does. But many days we're just not so sure that he cares for us. So we better take things under control ourselves again. But friends, he does. He cares. He proved it by sending his own son to die for you. He settled that issue for all time at the cross. Any God who would sacrifice his own son for a person like me must care for me and for you. There's no other reason he would do that. And if he did that back then, he's not about to give up on you now. And so when we come to him with our burdens and worries and cares, we don't have to convince him to listen to us. We don't have to chant or shout or burn incense or ring bells or offer a sacrifice. We come as his children, and he gladly hears us. We can't do anything good or bad to make God love us any more or less. He just does. And because of that, we can unload our worries on him. What freedom from fear and worry is ours when we humbly rest in this 
God's sovereign care. When we live in the reality that his love, his care for us, his mighty hand to save us is there, and it will. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. He blesses the humble, he exalts the humble, he cares for the humble. When we do this, we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 62, verse 5 through 8, Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. Notice how personal this is. My rock, my salvation, my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my rock, my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. This issue of humility is no small thing. It's not optional. It's important. It's essential. Augustine once said, If you ask me concerning the precepts of the Christian religion, first, second, third, and always, I would answer humility. Or as we read in Micah 6, 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? What's the summary? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Humble yourselves before each other. Humble yourselves before God by recognizing who he is, by trusting in his will and timing, and by handing over your worries to his care. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you care for us. We thank you for your patience with us who are so prideful so often, who are so consumed with ourselves, who are so obsessed with me world, who are so driven by independence, by self-sufficiency, by I'll do everything I have to do, and if I have to, I'll pray and ask God for the rest. Lord God, I pray that you would help us to humble ourselves, help us to come to you first and always. Help us to know that we are not the be-all, end-all, but you are. And that you care for us, and you love us, and you are right there with us. Pray that that humility would seep into the proudest parts of our heart. That we would be humble, yes, before you, but that hum- humility before you, that that would overflow into our relationships with others that we would be a blessing, that we would be an instrument of your peace in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our church. Pray this all for your glory. Amen. Stand with us as we close. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross, love so amazing, love so
invite everybody to stick around for Sunday school at 1030. Information on that is in your bulletins. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Jesus Messiah.